So today I will talk about more uh, quantum algorithms for systems of linear equations. Um, after being almost 18 years in this field, I'm still positive that quantum computers will one day be able to solve problems and applications that are beyond reach of classical computers. And, um, and quantum algorithm design appears to be the main reason why there are so many investments uh, in these technologies. But anyone that's been in this field knows that uh, building new quantum algorithms, improving upon the existing ones, or even finding applications for them is really hard, really hard. So here we're looking for needles in haystacks, basically. And, uh, and today I will talk uh, in particular for quantum algorithms for linear algebra problems. So some of the ideas that I present have been discussed before, but I will go into more detail. A couple of relevant works. Uh, my talk will be these two papers in 2017 and 2019. And let me introduce to you the linear system problem. This is a problem that is ubiquitous in science and uh, engineering technologies. Um, we're given a matrix A specified in some way. This matrix uh, is of dimension N. You may think of this big N as being really large, okay, exponentially large, maybe in some problem size. We're given some vector B, uh, again, specified in some way, and I'll explain that more uh, later. And the linear system problem is basically uh, finding a vector X that solves the equation AX equal to B, all right? So classical algorithms for this problem um, typically take time, which is a uh, polynomial in the dimension of the matrix. And um, one of the best known general purpose classical algorithms, conjugate gradient, scaling goes with linearly in N and linearly in kappa, which is known as the condition number of the matrix, which basically is a way of to quantify how far a matrix is from being invariable. So the quantum linear system problem is some trick that we've done to the previous linear system problem. So this becomes now amenable to quantum computers. So the idea is that given the previous system of linear equations, now our goal is not really solving the system, but preparing a quantum state that encodes information about the solution of the system. So this quantum state X is proportional um, to the solution vector of the equation AX equal to B. So in more detail, I mean, the problem is defined such that we want to prepare a quantum state that is epsilon close to the exact state X. Okay, so this epsilon quantifies the error. Uh, this distance is known as a trace distance. Basically, if I were to, to prepare rows of X, on a quantum computer, then I wouldn't be able to distinguish it with probability larger than epsilon from the true state that I wanted to prepare. So all known results on this problem that's been discussed today kind of like reduced to this form. So why is this interesting at all, right? So, okay, well, on one side, linear systems appear everywhere. Um, on the other, we know that quantum computers are known to provide exponential quantum speedups for many problems. So this is natural to ask, understand what they can do in linear algebra problems such as this. And um, beyond linear systems, I could say that uh, studying pro new problems like this one sometimes result in new algorithmic primitives that are used in quantum other quantum algorithms. And this has been indeed the case for the linear system problem. So this quantum version of the problem, however, is only useful for computing, ex for example, expectation values on the solution of the system, but not for obtaining the vector, because that will require complexities at least linear in N, and we want to avoid any complexity that scales with the dimension of the matrix. So to understand quantum algorithms, um, we need to understand um, um, the complexity. So many times uh, we resort to what we call uh, query complexity, in which we assume, for example, that uh, we have access to procedures that uh, provide information about, for example, in this case, the matrix A or the vector B. This is the way that we can specify the, uh, the problem, the instance of the problem. So in this case, a query for A, for example, would compute a matrix element of A. A query for B would prepare an initial state that is proportional to the vector B. So, this kind of like set the rules of the game. The type of algorithms that we'll build will be based upon these two procedures. Um, for simplicity, I will assume that these procedures can be implemented in constant time, like with a constant number of two qubit gates. And I will not um, 
discuss in detail what are the inner workings of this procedure. So um, by setting this query model, then I'm setting the rules of the game of the type of algorithms I will build for this particular problem. So what are the known results about the quantum linear system problem? Um, well, we know about the former HHL algorithm, uh, it's scaling, asymptotic scaling, this order of notation has constants, which may be important in applications, but it was basically quadratic in the condition number and logarithmic in the dimension of the matrix, which is what made uh, the algorithm excited. Um, there's been a later improvement by M. Bynes. He introduced the notion of variable time amplitude amplification and was able to reduce the complexity to something that it was almost linear in the condition number, and this can be proven optimal uh, in the query model. More recently, uh, my paper with Charles Sakutari, um, we were able to reduce the scale in terms of precision uh, to something that was polylogarithmic. So this was an exponential improvement, and we'll discuss this into more detail. To this end, we have to introduce the notion of linear combination of unitaries, um, which basically um, uh, replace the phase estimation step uh, in the HHL algorithm. And there's been a couple of other algorithms based on adiabatic evolutions. This paper in 2018 um, is again inspired by adiabatic um, evolution. It's a randomized algorithm. We were able again to obtain a linear scaling in the condition number, so almost optimal there. And other improvements by Ann and Lin uh, where they basically de randomized the algorithm that we present. I should point out that there's been other algorithms. Uh, we heard today about um, other approaches. Uh, those approaches are similar. Uh, their core um, ideas are similar to this idea of linear combination of unitaries in which the EM are approximating um, um, the inverse function, for example. So why are these results important at all? Well, so on one side, it's nice to know that we were able to uh, obtain optimal algorithms for the quantum linear system problem. We knew about the lower bound, but we didn't know whether we could achieve it. These improvements allow us to prove some other true quantum speedups and explain those a little bit more later. And uh, for example, the approach based on linear combination of unitaries or related approach on quantum signal processing, um, this allows us to reduce the complexity in terms of precision which is very important if we need to perform high precision calculations at the end in the state that we prepare. And on the other side, this adiabatic spiral algorithm, uh, because it was so simple, it had a record at least until last year, I think being the biggest implementation uh, to solve a linear system on a quantum computer, uh, just as A by eight system, but um, it opened the possibility of uh, dealing with, uh, with larger problem sizes. All right, so as I mentioned, right, I mean, on one side, we're claiming there is an exponential speed up because the complexities are only polylogarithmic in the dimension of the matrix. But in reality, these algorithms do not output the full vector, okay? So when looking for applications, this becomes challenging. Uh, people have looked at this. Here I mentioned a few examples. We know that, for example, uh, we can use these algorithms for computing the resistance of a network. The speed up there is not exponential, it's polynomial. There's another uh, application, for example, uh, computing the hidden time of a Markov chain. Again, the polynomial, uh, the speed up we saw there was polynomial, not exponential. And there's been applications in machine learning and solving certain linear differential equations where the speed ups are truly unknown, okay? It will depend on type of instance, what type of speed up we can have. So finding applications, I mean, it's kind of, finding applications is hard, um, we kind of like have uh, the hammer, but we need to find for more nails. All right, so I'll give you a quick review of the HHL algorithm, and then I show how to improve. All right, so let's assume that we have a matrix A. There is a spectral decomposition. There are eigenvectors of the matrix, eigenvalues lambda to J, all right? And I will assume that kappa is my condition number, so the eigenvalues range all the way from one over kappa to one, all right? So if kappa is very large, then the lowest second value will be very small and the matrix will be harder to invert. So the HHL algorithm starts by preparing the initial state B that encodes the vector B in the linear system, okay? We know loss of generality is a, a spectral decomposition of it. It uses what the so-called phase estimation algorithm to perform a map in which now I have a register of qubits that give me some eigenvalue estimates, okay? Then I apply a one con qubit conditional rotation to perform the map in which I rotate one qubit depending on what the eigenvalue was, all right? 
and do the phase estimation step. And at the end, basically, I have something, a quantum state that has two branches, one branch noted by zero here, which really implemented something that was proportional or approximate to the, uh, the inverse of the matrix, the state that we want, and something that I call the bad part of the state that is labeled by ancillary qubit being in one. We can use a well-known technique called amplitude amplification as using Grover's algorithm to basically get rid of the bad part of the state with one and boost the probability of getting the right part of the state uh, towards one. The complexity of this HHL algorithm is mainly given by how many uh, rounds of amplitude amplification I need, and what is the complexity of the phase estimation step. A detailed analysis gives the scaling that I gave at the beginning, which is almost quadratic in the condition number and polylogarithmic in the dimension of the matrix. So how can we improve such an algorithm? Okay, so the first idea that came by um, Ambinis in 2012 was um, based on this technique of variable time amplitude amplification. So rather than doing amplitude amplification in one step as the HHL algorithm does, okay, what variable time amplitude amplification does is split the state into branches depending what the eigenvalues are, larger and lower eigenvalues, and does variable, uh, does amplitude amplification to each of the branches sequentially. Okay, so this allows you to go from a quadratic scale in the condition number to something that is linear, and certainly I don't have time to discuss more details about this. Another idea, which is in the, our 2017 paper, in order to improve upon the precision scaling, uh, was to approximate the inverse operator by something else. Okay, instead of doing phase estimation, for example, we can use a Fourier transformation, okay, that approximates the inverse of A as a linear combination of unitaries. So this unit that is here would correspond, for example, the evolution standard of the matrix A for some time. And one can show that by using this Fourier approach, that time is at most logarithmic in the inverse of the precision parameter. And this is what it allows uh, basically to prove an exponential improvement in terms of precision. So other approximations can be used here as polynomial approximations that we saw before. Uh, I picked the, the Fourier tram, uh, transform as one of them because it gives us, you know, the, the interesting results. But um, that paper also contains uh, approximations based, for example, on Chebyshev polynomials. So how? So once we do have this linear combination of unitaries, how is that we are going to implement them? So there is this nice uh, quantum primitive that we developed for Hamiltonian simulation methods. Basically, what it do is they map a state psi to a linear combination to a linear combination, okay, of two unitaries V1 and V2 uh, by using this uh, quantum primitive that we have here. So the, the operation B, basically what it does, it rotates an ancilla such that the state after that rotation calls the coefficients alpha and beta, and we have to do such an operation at the end. When we look at the state at the end, we have two components, okay, two branches, and one of the branches is the state that we want to, so we may use again amplitude amplification to boost that amplitude up. All right, so um, while we prove that this linear combination of unitary approach has optimal asymptotic uh, complexity, it still requires many ancillary qubits. This can be further improved by, for example, using the techniques of quantum signal processing, but in this case, it still would require many ancillas. So we resolve this issue of having many ancillas by providing a new quantum algorithm inspired by algebraic evolutions, and I go through it fairly quickly. So this Algorithm is based on a randomization method that we developed with Boyce and Neil uh, in a 2009 paper. The idea is similar to the idea of adiabatic evolutions. There is a Hamiltonian path, an interpolating path, such that the eigenstate of the first of the first Hamiltonian can be mapped along the evolution to the eigenstate of the final Hamiltonian, and we chose those Hamiltonians such that the eigenstate of the final one is the desired state that solves the quantum linear system problem. Rather than doing these evolutions in continuous lean time, this randomization method, basically what it does is it picks Hamiltonians along the path and evolves with them for a random time. This simulates measurements, okay? And these measurements, basically due to the scene effect, uh, will map, will transform one quantum state to the other again state with high probability. So by picking the discretization in the path, right? then we can assure that we had probability we will evolve towards the state that we want to, to prepare here. So we could show that 
the Hamiltonian set we chose, the minimum spectral gap goes with the inverse of the condition number, that the eigenstate of these Hamiltonians, in fact, correspond to linear systems of increasing complexity. So at the beginning, I'm solving a very simple system. At the end, I'm solving the system that I want to. And in fact, the eigenstate of the final Hamiltonian is the solution of the quantum linear system problem. When you look at the scaling of this algorithm, it almost scales linearly with the condition number, again, polylogarithmic in the dimension and with the inverse of the precision parameter. And this technique, as I said before, can be de-randomized by a purely adiabatic approach that was provided by Anne and Lynn in the 2018 paper and was discussed before. All right, so um, the next thing is that the asymptotic complexity of this adiabatic inspired approach is almost optimal if we are looking at constant precision. The algorithm is built upon simple Hamiltonian involutions. I didn't discuss the Hamiltonians, but those Hamiltonians are fairly simple and they don't need techniques, complicated techniques such as variable time amplitude amplification that require many ancillary qubits. In fact, in here, only one additional ancillary qubit need, was needed. And while the complexity was linear in the inverse of the precision, it can also be made logarithmic in this quantity by using one of the many known methods, for example, for a game by traversal or uh, quantum state filtering, as we heard uh, in a previous talk. So, um, so the, there's been other proposals for this quantum linear system problem, okay? Uh, many of those proposals were based on variational and related quantum algorithms to this problem. And some of the claims is that these approaches may be useful for noisy quantum technologies, for example, for NISC devices, may solve, for example, the quantum linear system problem, may not need uh, quantum error correction, and so on. But when you look at it, uh, you give a closer look to such proposals, when um, it becomes evident that on one side they require a costly optimization look. Remember, these variational approaches aim at minimizing some cost function, all right? So we have to have some sort of feedback in which the information that we got from computing some expectation value has to be fed into the initial state preparation and repeating this many times. At the same time, and related to this, is that these cost functions have to be computed at very high precision. And that precision has to depend on property, on um, uh, parameters such as the condition number of the matrix, all right? So when you put everything together and you look at um, random instances of this problem, you can see that this has some unknown or even poor performance. And the performance could be even worse than that from the algorithms that I described today. Um, in fact, I would say that these two reasons are um, two of the main reasons that, uh, that basically will kill many of the proposals for using NISC devices um, in many problems in linear algebra. And these are uh, two of the things that we will have to really look into when we design um, um, uh, quantum algorithms that are amenable to this device. All right, so I'm wrapping up. And um, so, so what I want to say basically is conclude is that quantum computing is promising, that we know that there's problems, uh, quantum algorithms for some problems in linear algebra. Uh, I describe some quantum algorithms for solving problems related to linear systems with number of improvements in terms of precision, condition, number, and so on. The complexity is logarithmic in the dimension, all right? But um, the, the, techni the techniques that I developed can also be used in other algorithms and problems, for example, in Hamiltonian simulations, uh, as it was the case for, for, for these techniques that we developed here. I also presented a few applications for this, including machine learning, okay? Uh, but it would be really nice to have many more. And again, as I said before, I think we do have the hammer, but it would be nice to have more nails for this problem. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>